Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, I hope you liked your intermission. Uh, I would like to pick up uh, right where we left off uh, and turn to Congressman Bishop uh, and discuss what Matt Peterson talked about, which is the problem of our understanding of the economy, that it is a neutral space, which effectively has meant for the past generation that the left makes advances and the right stands idly by. Uh, now, Congressman, you have been interested in antitrust laws and thinking about ESG from that perspective. Could you talk a little bit about that, please? Well, I, uh, yeah, I joined uh, Chairman Jordan of the Judiciary Committee back in July uh, asking for information from Vanguard and I think BlackRock and some other en entities on the degree to which uh, uh, there, there's an there's a, an agreement in restraint of trade concerning decarbonization and, and the like, uh, all the ESG initiatives. And I will just say that I think it's today there's an announcement that uh, uh, Chairman Jordan has followed that up because the, what's been forthcoming is limited. And, uh, and so subpoenas have been issued to uh, Vanguard and Aruna Capital. Uh, and uh, I, I think that, that it's, you know, it seems like something that's been obvious. It's staring us in the face. And the question is just whether uh, we're going to permit it to go on at, uh, endlessly, or as you say, um, you know, it's it's a it is an economic war being waged by uh, by uh, means of uh, by unfair means. It, agreements and restraint of trade must be responded to by Congress, and and committees in Congress can find out uh, what's been going on, and then we'll see what happens after that. And what must some of your colleagues here think who would be on outside in principle, but? but uh, discourage you from pursuing this? I mean, do they think that things will simply normalize in time? I think generally about your thesis, uh, Arthur, and some of the uh, materials I've seen. I saw your interview with uh, Kevin Roberts. Uh, and I, I think there is, look, I, I've been in Congress since 2019. Uh, one of the things you said is that maybe we need to look to states. I agree with that. I'm leaving Congress to go run to be Attorney General of North Carolina for exactly the reason you're talking about. I think as a, as a general theme, the problem is there's a lack of will, a lack of courage in uh, people who've served in Congress for far too long and who are, who are uh, nominally conservative, and that's got to change. And so it's a matter of using it, this, this timidity in responding to an all-out assault on the American way of life by a radicalized left cannot be, it is not a solution. And so, yeah, I think that you've got to pick uh, uh, use tools that you've been we've been reticent about, and if people are are scandalized by that, well, I'm sorry, that's just too bad. Thank you, um, Representative Babin. We yes, we talked about immigration a little bit. Uh, I just have a basic question: Why does the right always talk about doing something about immigration and never does anything? You've seen it from the inside. Tell us. Absolutely. When I got elected in uh, fourteen. Uh, and I sit on committees that really don't have jurisdiction. Unlike Dan, I don't sit on juris on, on ju uh, uh, judiciary. judiciary. Uh, but I, it's such a major issue, and especially being from the state of Texas. Uh, it is, I think it's the most important issue that we face as far as danger, because uh, the imminent uh, danger that, that an open border has for us is just overwhelming. And quite frankly, just as, as Dan said, uh, uh, we don't have 100 percent will in the Republican Party to uh, secure the borders. The uh, Democrat Party certainly does not want to uh, have uh, secure borders because they see this as a political thing. This is a this is a, a source of votes, a source of uh, chaos to inflict upon the country uh, with a Marxist intention of of uh, Nihilism, anarchy, uh, Marxists pick up the pieces routinely. You look look at your history books. It, that's, this is the way they operate. And uh, quite frankly, uh, the the House of Representatives. I was so proud, having served on my on my fifth term. Uh, we passed HR two, which I think is the uh, historically I think it's the toughest, best. Uh, border bill, border security bill that, that has that has come out of out of the Congress in modern times, and unfortunately, it's withering and gathering dust over in the Senate because they are in, the Democrats are in control there. Um, 
You know, and, 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 and in his paper, Michael Antone said, uh, we're so blinkered by ideology that we can't or won't apply obvious solutions to simple problems. We know what, I'm a dentist by profession. Uh, I'm used to getting things done. Somebody comes to my office uh, have, having a dental problem, or we diagnose it. Uh, we sell that to the to the patient. We I say sell. We 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 convince the patient that the treatment is necessary, and we get the thing done, and they leave usually smiling and and happy. Uh, up here, uh, it doesn't seem to work like that. Um, I wish it did, uh, but it doesn't. One day last week, we had twelve thousand illegals come across the border. Uh, most of them over in uh, uh, in in uh, Arizona. And thanks to the great state of Texas and our, our governor, uh, I have been trying to convince him for a long time to, to declare an invasion, and I was very, very happy that he did uh, because seven of my nine counties that I represent, county resolutions, said, this is an invasion, Congressman. We are being overwhelmed, and guess what? We are nearly 300 miles from the border in my district. My district is in the Houston area uh, to Louisiana. And uh, we simply have got to, 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 to secure this border. If we don't, I don't see uh, this country lasting as we know it. That's just the simple fact of the matter. We should not be negotiating border security. We should be enacting it. And quite frankly, I, I, can't, I can't sit up here and explain and, and, and speak on behalf of some of my Republican colleagues that won't vote for border security. It's either they're, they're foolishly compassionate or, you know, about uh, they've been convinced by the Democrats that this is the right thing to do, or it could be an ideological thing as well, or it could be an economic thing. I think uh, we all know that the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, there, there's, there's groups that you would think would be Republicans, uh, U.S. Chambers, one of them, that uh, it's an economic thing. They want cheap labor. And uh, since the pandemic, we've got major, major uh, unemployment by folks that just simply won't seek a job because they're they're being uh, they're cashing a check each month and don't need to work. And so it's a it's an economic it's it's, an, it's totally economics uh, when you look at it from that standpoint. But the Republican Party, let me tell you something: if we put a Republican back in the White House. He has got to have interior enforcement in a major way. We've already had nine to 10 million cross. We cannot allow those people to stay in here. We have to have interior enforcement. We have the, another whole year to go. As we said, 12,000 cross in one day. How many are going to come across by the end of this year? We cannot incentivize further illegal immigration to leave these folks uh, without interior enforcement uh, in this country will be nothing but incentivization uh, to keep coming. They know they, if they get in, they, they can stay, and eventually uh, they, will, they will have, as the Democrats, we've, we've seen their very first bill under Nancy Pelosi, H.R. 1, was a takeover of our, uh, our election process by the federal government, and in, included in that was the ability for foreign nationals to vote. And uh, we know what it is. I mean, everybody knows that this is what's going on there. And so we have to make sure that we uh, start incentivizing, disincentivizing uh, illegal immigration. And uh, sad to say that Republicans do. We talk about border issues, but we can't seem to get on the same page. But I will say this, and I've already mentioned it, H.R. 2 is a tough, good bill that would put this country on the road to a secure border if only the Democrats uh, would let that come, uh, come to the floor in the, in, the, in the Senate. This next year's election is going to make that determination. Thank you, sir. Uh, Representative Hageman, thank you for coming. Uh, it's very nice to see you again. Uh, your victory was extraordinarily important. Uh, the person that, was, that occupied that seat was persecuting the right. Uh, and the landslide in which you won was a marvelous moment for many that many celebrated. And therefore, in a way, it's, a, it's an optimistic case for the future, uh, as opposed to some of the very pessimistic observations that we've made here so far. 
flesh it out. What would it mean? How should the right look optimistically on its future? What would it need to change about itself, confront about itself, to move forward in a successful way? Well, thank you, Arthur. Uh, thank you for having me here today. And uh, thank you for having me here today. And I think one of the things that we have to recognize, and this builds a bit more on your last panel and some of the points that the, they made, we have to understand how we got to the current position of where we are if we're going to be able to fix it going forward. And one of the things that I think is critically important is understanding what happened about 85 years ago and then move forward on steroids starting under the Clinton administration. And that is the dramatic expansion in the administrative state. So what has happened is we turned over so much of our legislating, Congress, the congressional body, and this has happened at both the state and federal levels, we've turned over so much of our legislating responsibility to the unelected bureaucrats that the unelected bureaucrats are the ones that are dictating policy in this country. And we were talking just a moment ago about the concept of disparate impact. Well, disparate impact was created in the early 1970s by the EEOC as a mechanism by which they could control what was going on in the boardroom and private companies. The interesting thing about that is the EEOC, number one, has no rulemaking authority. The disparate impact requirements have never been put into rules because they can't be. And yet here we are 40, 50, 40, 50 years later, where every time there is a disparate outcome in any kind of an action uh, taken in a private company, you've got uh, enforcement mechanisms that swoop in and attempt to tell these private companies what they can do. So when you want to find out why our corporations have become in, have have become the mouthpieces of the left wing or the of, or the woke? What you have to understand is that administrative agencies and regulatories have an inordinate amount of power in this country, and they have wielded it in a way that they know they would never get the policies through if they actually had to to vote on them. So when Congress and our state legislators abdicate the responsibility of not legislating, but instead write into their statutes themselves, it is up to the EEOC to determine how this how this statute will be, will be carried out, or it is up to the Secretary of Interior to carry out the intent of this particular bill dealing with the, our, our Bureau of Land Management lands, then you can understand that the left has been able to move things further and further and further and further to the left, despite the fact that we are a center-right country. So I think one one of the things that's critically important and why I'm optimistic is that more people are understanding this and recognizing what the administrative uh, regulatory regime does to us every day. So I'm very proud to serve on the Judiciary Committee with Dan and Jim Jordan, and I'm also on the Select Committee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government. And while we don't have the Senate and we don't have the White House right now, what I do believe we've been able to do pretty effectively is expose the nature of what is going on in this country. We had Jonathan Turley as one of our very first witnesses in the, in the Select Committee on Weaponization, and we talked about a violation of, of our First Amendment rights through surrogacy. So it isn't that Joe Biden went out and said, you can't say that, or it isn't that, the, that one of us went out and said that. What did they do? They went to Facebook, and they went to Twitter, and they went to all of these companies, and they said, we don't like what's being said here. We don't like these jokes. We don't like these statements. We don't like anybody pushing back on COVID. And so they got the companies to do their dirty work. And then they sat back and said, well, that wasn't us. We didn't do that. But that's illegal. And in Missouri versus Biden, we have two incredible decisions saying that. And I think the United States Supreme Court will affirm that outcome. We've had Matt Taibbi and uh, Michael Schellenberger come and describe what they have been able to un uncover and disclose. And I always say sunshine is the best disinfectant, and this place needs to be fumigated. Um, and with, uh, with, with those two gentlemen and others like them, we have been able to expose the level of censorship that all of us are living under. And all of us are now saying, no, -uh, no more, no more, no more. We're not doing this anymore. So we're getting pushback from the people who need to give, who need, who need to be pushing back. So number one, I think that we need to understand that when Congress does not do its job of legislating, we're the only ones who can be held accountable. You brought up in introducing me, I beat Liz Cheney. I beat her because she did what we didn't want her to do, so we threw her out of office, right? That's called accountability. That's what voting does. That's the kind of country that we have. But who runs the EEOC? Who's the undersecretary of the undersecretary of the undersecretary who ensures that we enforce disparate impact rules and regulations? We don't know. They can never be held accountable. We've got to push that decision-making authority back to Congress where it belongs. You need to hold people like me accountable. We need to be exposing what the administrative state has ultimately done to us, and then we can fight back against it and expose it 
because it is such an antithesis to the very foundation of our form of government, which is separation of power and individual rights. And if you look at the separation of powers, the very purpose of that paradigm was to make sure that our individual rights were protected, whether it was from the executive branch or the judicial or the legislative branch. That's our form of government, and we erase it when we allow unelected bureaucrats to make the decisions. So that's why I'm optimistic, because I think we're talking about things. I've been talking about this for 25 years, but I was a practicing attorney who had to fight it every day. But a lot of people don't know where it comes from. Now we have ways in which to fight back, and my friend Dan Bishop and I right now, we're trying to find a way to put forward, push forward with a bill that would hold individual federal employees, if they violate someone's First Amendment right, they can be held personally accountable. We're trying to create the federal version of 42 USC section 1983, because we believe that if these folks are actually held accountable for violating the Constitution, they're gonna be a lot less inclined to violate the Constitution. I think that's a step in the right direction. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Bishop, Mr. Bishop, maybe you can pick up from there. Uh, RAINS Act, uh, that has been proposed for many years. We'd like to know your opinion on that and what would be the next step after that? There are tens of thousands of hostile bureaucrats that want to limit, stymie everything that we do, even if it so happens we recapture the White House. Um, Arthur, the it's a great question. The RAINS Act is a great idea, uh, and it, it's been, but it's been around as an intellectual uh, notion for uh, 15, 20 years, right. and, um, and we, we proposed it as part of the uh, Limit, Save, Grow package that the, we got, actually got 218 votes on uh, before the debt ceiling negotiations this year. But the, the idea is that just that, it, uh, a reg and you can define it by different thresholds, but a regulation having major economic impact uh, uh, can't go forward unless it's approved by Congress. And, uh, and, and that makes all the sense in the world. We, we, we have right now EPA proposing a rule on CAFE standards that would radically alter the marketplace for automobiles in the United States. Basically, and I forget the numbers, but it would require some, like two-thirds of them to be EVs in, in, in practical effect. And let me tell you, uh, among other things, automobile dealers know that people don't want them. They don't want to buy them. And so they know that that's... that's it, Range Act wouldn't permit that to happen because what, what's happening is member, members of Congress are getting on letters to beseech the EPA not to go forward with a rule making law that Congress would never do, would never, because the people would be thrown out of office for it, uh, and yet the EPA is just going to roll on under a, a, a conception of their power that no one ever thought they had uh, to, to, uh, to radically alter the ability of American people to use uh, automobiles, one of the keys, frankly, to freedom. And um, so, so the Range Act would be a great idea, but again, we put it in a piece of legislation, but we weren't prepared to fight for it. We weren't prepared to stand in the breach to see to it that it got done. That's why, and then slip into a, a, a parallel concept, uh, your last panel made reference to uh, the a corrupted civil rights regime. Well, the reason that we see action having been taken on uh, barring what uh, what Harriet and I are proposing, but action ta being taken on the what the district court in Louisiana called the most massive uh, attack on free speech in U.S. history in the Missouri versus Biden case is because it, that that was left that was required state attorneys general to take action that Congress has not taken firm action to deal with. I had uh, the in a subcommittee hearing last week, uh, the assistant attorney general for the civil rights division of the Department of Justice was there. And my question was whether there's any criminal investigation or prosecution ongoing within the Justice Department on those, with respect to those persons who colluded to undertake what that district court described in a case that's been affirmed by the Fifth Circuit is now on further appeal to the United States Supreme Court. And her answer was not whether or not there's an investigation or prosecution. She said, I'm sorry, Congressman, I don't know what that litigation is. And I followed up because I was so dumbfounded. I said, you do. I said, again, th this is what the district court said the case was about. It's, 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 on the, it's in the United States Supreme Court now. You don't know what that is? I'm sorry, Congressman. Maybe if you could describe it more, I would. So that is the first, is the First Amendment a civil right? 
That, that, so in other words, we have a we have a, a very ideolo uh, there's ideology governing what the Department of Justice is doing in civil rights. So it's become a weapon of ideological warfare by one segment of the of the country against another. What the Justice Department should be doing is to enforce our basic civil rights. In fact, said the Justice Department has become the instrumentality of attacking them. A as you say, well, I'll say first. You know, Harry and I have this bill. That there's a, there's a, that little, the, the Supreme Court has decided there's no Bivens action for, for those who know what that is for a, a First Amendment claim. It's totally unreme irremediable by someone who's been injured by that deprivation of rights, which has been at scale. So Congress won't take a step. Members of Congress can't be persuaded to stand in the breach and, rec and, and, reduce the uh, the appropriations to the Justice Department or the FBI or otherwise re reform that in the radical way that it obviously needs to be done. If there is a Republican administration, the question you have to ask yourself is whether there'll be a, an attorney general confirmable by the Senate who will take the remedial actions necessary. And I mean, Hunter Biden's uh, protection by in the uh, in the Department of Justice occurred across the Trump administration. I'm saying there's got to be a different, they have to be a, a fairly radical reset of the mind to be able to take the actions necessary to move the needle. Otherwise, we're all standing there gross, gross, greatly upset about any number of phenomena, but completely impotent to do something about it. And, uh, and that's why I think Tools, not to hit it again, but I mean, the Missouri versus Biden's attorney general litigation, as I say, I'm going to do try to do that. That's not actually a healthy thing either, that we're looking to, a real, frankly, a transformed uh, state office, the attorney general offices, to litigate issues that ought to be able to be solved as a matter of policy through sensible exercise of Congress. And instead, we have members of Congress sit here like eunuchs asking the, uh, the, the please, EPA, do not destroy the car market. And um, I, I just think something that, that so I'm, I'm very drawn to the idea that, that there is, uh, that, that, there, that's, that we, <laughs> we must have, I think you take President Trump's history. He, he, someone said at one point in time, he's teaching the GOP how to fight. And I think what, what you're talking about in this conference is bring the intellectual heft to the same general attitude. The idea, I mean, I'm not trying to liken it to President Trump. I'm simply saying, after you sit in Congress for 25 years and see no meaningful impact on the status quo, I don't see doing the same thing over again should lead anybody to expect a different result. There must be a change of mind. There, it must be that members of Congress who get elected serving the status quo or worsening it, even if they go out and talk in election time about what we want to do, should find that incompatible with remaining in Congress or with rising to leadership in Congress. Just my view. But sir, just to follow up very briefly on this, I mean, surely you make this case to some of your colleagues in private. Uh, uh, right now, uh, in another room in the Capitol, we're talking about what FISA reform bill will come to the floor tomorrow. And we're going to see, what's going to happen tomorrow is we're going to see a bill, a FISA reform bill, which is in the jurisdiction of the Judiciary Committee, they're going to put up two. One coming out of the Intel Committee, <laughs> which is supposed to exercise in, ever, oversight over Intel. It's going to come, they're going to handle their own bill in judiciary jurisdiction on the floor. It's never been done before. Not ever. So you're going to get two bills on the floor. Whichever one gets greater votes is going to go forward. But one of them is, comes out of the Judiciary Committee, which after all of the abuses under FISA Section 702, will expand the authority of the intel state under that law. Their bill. Their bill. Their bill. Right, their bill. But the, but the one that must proceed, that's the point. You, and I will say, I actually think one other thing, and this one's a little frightening perhaps, but I think that for us to begin to make progress, it's going to start first. This is going to sound inconsistent with what I've said. It's going to start first in that area where you can attract bipartisan support against orthodoxy or against conventional wisdom. And that may be one. If the, if the judiciary FISA reform bill goes forward tomorrow, it's going to be because Democrats, frankly, farther left Democrats, 
have the same concerns with the intel state that, um, that civil libertarians on the right have. So we'll see what happens. But you're, you're absolutely right uh, that it, um, it, is, it, is, it, it is ubiquitous in the matters that happen here. There is um, the, the meaningful reform that gets blunted every time by uh, sort of a, uh, you know, a, a notion that, I don't know, it's, whether it's hand-wringing, Republicans, conservatives, they're conservatives, frankly. They will speak at length. They will worry a great deal about all these phenomena that threaten the American people, but they, they will not meet the moment when it comes down to something that, um, that requires shutting the government down for a period of time or requires negotiating over the debt limit, something, or, or in, the, in the thing that we see coming forward perhaps soon, H.R. 2 in exchange for further aid to Ukraine. I've never voted for any U aid to Ukraine. But what, what I think that actually sounds like it's devolving into is perhaps some gesture towards border security. If it's not H.R. 2, if it's not a fundamental change, it's not going to fix anything. And I think the American people, I can tell you this, I go around, I see, I see voters a lot, uh, Republican voters. And it's amazing how much farther they are ahead than Congress. Yes. And, and in fact, all the folks that we're working together with in Washington need to take a lesson from the people who are out there. I don't think it's pandering to say it. They have figured things and they are so beside themselves with frustration that they see time after time, give us another chamber, give us the White House. We're going to fix it when we have the White House. And it never comes to pass. I will say this last thing. Unless there is a move, a change, unless the kind of re-examination happens quickly and it produces real courage, will, talked about ferocity and ruthlessness. I don't know if I'd use those terms, vehemence, certainly. If that doesn't happen, um, whole swaths of what otherwise is going to, it would be the, the following to a general, to general con conservatism in general will fall away because it's wholly useless to continue to pursue it if it can, if they can be talked about and cosmetically, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, presented, but never actually pursued when the when the chips are down. Right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Babbitt. You know that uh, Australia some years ago uh, birthright citizenship, and then they got rid of it. Uh, and you also know that uh, President Trump, for a long time, discussed putting forth an executive order. Uh, to change our current understanding of uh, birthright citizenship. And that also, uh, uh, well, was brushed under the rug, was forgotten about. It's not entirely clear. Uh, but you have been thinking about this, presented a bill on it. Could That's you right. tell us a little bit about it and why this is so important? Well, it's, it's extremely important. I mean, again, the border and immigration are destroying our great republic. That's what's happening. And it, so much so that I, even though I, I'm, I'm on transportation and infrastructure and space science and technology, I serve as one of the co-chairs on the House Border Security Caucus and also serve on the task force on uh, uh, Mexican drug cartels. But I feel so strongly about the, about the uh, birthright citizenship that, as you said, uh, I have introduced to the Birthright Citizenship Act of 2023 uh, and for a period, this is, com comes out of the 14th Amendment, for, for a period following the enactment of the 14th Amendment, Section 1, it was properly applied as written and as, as intended to ensure that all American citizens were afforded the sacred constitutional protections that they deserve. And this was after the Civil War. Uh, and while these are important uh, protections, they remain in recent decades, this 14th Amendment has been misapplied and misinterpreted. Uh, the, the specific language in the amendment has led to the, uh, the implementation uh, of the practice of birthright citizenship by which children born to foreign nationals, from illegal immigrants to tourists to refugees, are automatically granted United States citizenship. It has created birth tourism. There's an entire industry uh, on this right now. Unsurprisingly, birthright citizenship is a very, very powerful incentive for illegal immigration, and over time it has been wrongly accepted uh, as, as the law. 
uh, with supporters claiming that our Constitution guarantees it. It does not. I am a dentist. I am not an attorney. But read that 14th Amendment. You don't have to be an attorney to see that this thing has been totally misapplied and misinterpreted. Uh, I think this issue is, has to be brought to the Supreme Court. Uh, we cannot guarantee success there. Uh, I think right now, uh, with the, uh, uh, the, the current uh, uh, membership of the court, I think we have a good shot at having this, this thing uh, reinterpreted in a way that, that would, do, uh, uh, would do some real good. But we will never have the opportunity unless we stand up and fight for birthright citizenship to be uh, reinterpreted uh, in a way that uh, makes sense. Our immigration system is supposed to benefit the United States of America. It is not there to benefit foreign nationals who want to come into the United States. And as you've heard both of these other individuals tonight say, it's going to take courage. We've got to stand up because no one likes to be called xenophobe, homophobe, Islamophobe, uh, yeah, all kinds of phobes. Um, dentist phobe. I, I dealt with that. For, <laughs> I dealt with that for 38 years. Um, but birthright citizenship is enabled by this faulty legal application, ending the practice uh, by clarifying the eligibility of, of birthright citizenship is a necessary step in fixing this broken immigration system that we have and stopping the, the complete exploitation of the generosity of the United States of America. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, we, we have just a few minutes remaining. Um, and Mrs. Hageman, I want to talk a little bit about what you see from your constituents. I mean, as I said before, they resoundingly voted for something different. These frustrations have been going on for so long uh, throughout the country, especially visible in your district, but throughout the country. W what do you see? I mean, this, this cannot build forever. You know, it either goes in one direction or in another. What, what do you see? So uh, I didn't intend to run for Congress, but when I watched our representative fail us on so many different levels, and failed to listen to the citizens of Wyoming, I realized that it was time to step up and actually become engaged on a completely different level than I had been as a private attorney. So I have often said I was not running against Liz Cheney, but I was running for Wyoming. And I think it's important for every representative to feel that way. We aren't running against things, we are running for something. And there are so many things in the United States, and especially right now, to take that position on. So while I was running, I had the opportunity to give a speech, and it was called the We're Fed Up speech. And I don't know how many of you may have seen the video. It was, um, I, I didn't expect it to, to become the, the story that it has or to be seen as much as it has. But all I did was describe a litany or set forth a litany of the things that we are fed up with. And that is where the Wyoming people are, and it's where the American public is, and that's why I will agree with Dan, and I will agree with Brian both, that the American public and conservatives and Republicans and, and parents and business owners are further ahead than we are, we are in terms of recognizing where we're going if we don't change course. And this isn't something about changing course in 2027 or 2032. It is about changing course right now because we don't have a lot of runway left. We are fed up with a government that doesn't seem to work for the American public anymore. This seems to work very well for the elitists in Washington, DC. We are fed up with a Department of Education that believes that boys should be able to participate in girls' sports and that girls should simply uh, put up with that. We are fed up with the Nancy Pelosi's of the world. We're, the, we're fed up with the Hunter Bidens of the world. We're fed up with the way that our government is no longer working for us, but working for some of the people in Washington, D.C., and New York City, and Los Angeles, and allowing them to amalgamate and, and, and uh, stockpile more and more and more power for them and their, their, their friends, while the rest of us are, for, are left further behind. I come from the, one of the largest energy-producing states in the nation, and I'm extremely proud of that. 
We make everybody's lives better. We're the largest coal producers in the nation. We produced 250 million tons last year, and I hope it's double that next year. We produce oil and gas. We have the ability to produce uranium. Uh, we are some of, one of the top cattle producers in the nation. Everything that we do increases our prosperity. And the, 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 the fact is that our Constitution gave us the foundation of freedom and liberty, but it is affordable energy, housing, and food that has given us the prosperity that we have enjoyed in this country that is unrivaled in human history. We have a certain segment of the population right now that wants to take that away. And they're using everything from the UN to the COP28 to, to John Kerry and all of these other things to try to destroy our prosperity to do exactly what Brian has said, which is to implement a, a, a Marxist state of play that none of us want and that the people who are attempting to impose it will never have to live under. So what are the, what are the American or what do the Wyoming people say right now? They say we're fed up. We're fed up with the nonsense that comes out of this place where we can't fix problems, which are really not insurmountable. I, I'm the chairman of the subcommittee on Indian and Insular Affairs. I could list off 15 things right now that are bipartisan and bicameral that we could fix if we simply got the words down on paper, move back and forth across that little place out there, that little concrete island out there, about six times, we'd have it done and we'd solve problems. We have the ability to solve problems we don't because there is... There, there is a disincentive to solve problems. There is an incentive to continue to have them in play. And there is also a disin, there, there is an incentive to disenfranchise the American public. But again, why I'm optimistic is I'm not alone in saying these things. I'm not just screaming in the dark. There are a lot of leaders out there at the local, state, and national level. My, uh, many of my freshmen that I came into this class with feel exactly the same way that I do. Status quo is no longer acceptable. The status quo is no longer going to be tolerable because the American people have moved beyond just saying, we'll fix it next time. We can't just fix it next time. Next time is now. Next time is right now. We've got to fix these things. They aren't insurmountable. We have a document that tells us how to do it. We should have a judiciary who would help us to do it, and we need to have a legislative branch who's willing to push forward with what are common sense solutions to some, to some difficult issues, and some of them are gonna be harder than others, but doggone it, we gotta try. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and please thank our panelists.